The subject or the topic is Jesus' love. It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Let's get his input as we go through this message. Loving God, we just are so blessed by you. You constantly pour out your love into us, into our lives, in the many situations that we find ourselves. You are always there. You are the constant. And God, I just ask that you would take this message, speak it as you would, as you want, as we can hear specifically what you have for us. Thank you, God, for your involvement in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The question I, I start with, when you see this image, first of all, is there anyone in here that doesn't know who that image is? You can, based on things you've read, things you've studied, things you've heard, talk a lot about who this man is, the 12th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. So you know there's, there's a lot to this individual simply by seeing his picture. Anybody not know who that is? Again, you have in your mind, you can tell about John Wayne. You can tell stories. You can recite the movies, maybe the lyrics to some of the movies. But you understand who this is because of just a simple image. Again, has, has everyone know who Mother Teresa is? If the name is under it, you could tell stories of, uh, specifically of her work in Calcutta, Indy. The, the magnitude of what these people, and they're a part of who we are inside because we can talk about these people. Some of the uh, actions you would like to emulate, many you would not. To have the legacy of all three of those. It's a very group of people, but yet they all have a legacy. If someone was to take a candid shot of you that would encapsulate, that would summarize the best of you, what would you be doing? Someone may be playing a bass. Another one may be on a piano. Uh, another one may be sitting with a a pen and paper, writing uh, letters, writing a story. You know, I gave a lot of thought to that about me, and it was just purely me that I was trying to come up with. I'm not that one that likes selfies that, that gets in front of the camera, so that's... But I, I thought it would involve other people as a husband, a father, a grandfather, a papa, to my grandchildren, that would, to me, that would be the summarization, at least that I would like to have said about me. I mean, that's, that's but it usually involves other people. It's not just this stoic picture or a single image picture. Today's text, which was read to us, comes from John 13, verses 31 through 35. And I'm not going to reread those at this time. I am going to read John 13, 1 through 4. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Jesus, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel and tied it at his waist. Now I'm going to take some of the format that we're using in diagramming or dissecting the study in Mark, going back to chapter 3, 13, verse 1. 
now before. So this was before the Passover, before everybody got in the right places. We're, we're at the before, and Jesus knew that his time was coming. His time was up on this earth, and he loved everyone. everyone even, even those that didn't have a clue that they were loved, he loved. During supper, in the upper room, they would have had the meal. It was a changed format that they were experiencing, but they had a meal. And the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. So he's in the upper room. Jesus is in the upper room. The disciples are there in the room with him, and Judas has already made in his heart the awareness that he is going to betray Jesus. No one else except Jesus knew. He knew that Judas was about to go and do this betrayal. As they go through the evening, picture that upper room. The tables in all likelihood were maybe this far off the floor. You sat on the floor. You reclined at the floor. They would have been scattered around the room. John would have been seated but next to Jesus. But there is some indications that Judas was also seated beside Jesus. So they're there. The meal is uh, going on. So much is going on in that room. The impending Jesus' death, Judas' betrayal, the enthronement of Christ Jesus, the washing of feet, which was a servant's job. Think about the magnitude of, of all of those things. Jesus was fully aware of all of these things, and he's looking out at this group of men that he has loved, that he has spent time with, and he's knowing what's coming their way. He knows what's coming his way that will impact them. Let's consider three things. The example of the upper room in details. It was a Passover meal. They ate it together. Jesus washed feet. Peter's response, and we can remember what his response was. You can't wash my feet. Well, if I can't, then, well, no, wash all of me. That was the response of give and take. Jesus finishes washing feet and reclines back at the table. Judas was there. Can you imagine as Jesus was washing feet? his feet, knowing what was in his heart. Can you imagine Judas having Jesus lay everything down and become a servant and wash his feet, knowing that he's about to betray this man? There is so much emotion and passion in, in, in going on in that upper room that many were not aware of. After he washes his feet. They have eaten. Jesus dismisses Judas to go. Jesus washed Judas' feet knowing that he would be betrayed. And this is part of the reason that they say that Judas sat next to Jesus. Is Jesus identifies Judas by giving him a morsel of bread. If he was across the room, that would not have been able to do. But picture this, Jesus sharing the dish, his bread, with his betrayer, having just washed his feet. He shares an example before commenting on it. This, right here, what I just did, folks. Are you paying attention, guys? This is what the kingdom is like. That's what Jesus' message to them is saying it is servanthood and love. The second item is the command from John 13 and verse 34. 
a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. We are to love like Jesus. Even before you recognized or realized you were loved, you were. You may have been just going through the motions of life, but you didn't realize how much Jesus loved you. Even when you don't receive payment or reward, you were loved. Even when your love is not returned in kind, you are loved. Love because loving is just the very act of loving. That's the reward. Love for its own sake. Those are all the things that Jesus shown to us, that upper room that evening. In the culture of the time, there was a strong cultural exchange of quid pro quo. Are we any different today? Do we do a lot of, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. You watch my back, I'll watch your back. You do this for me, I'll do this for you. It's a lot of humanity. That's the way we function. We give gifts with expectation of receiving a gift in return. And if we don't get a gift in return, boy, that person's never getting a gift again. I mean, there is that process. There, there is that expectation. Well, I'm doing this for you. What do you mean you don't do anything back? We network to make connections for that right person to help us. I'll take care of you and you care for me. Have you ever experienced freely giving? When you give something, whether it's an act, whether it's a physical possession, uh, you give it with no expectation of any kind. That's, that's, a, that's a stretch. And you may, you may say that, but the next time you see that person or a year later you see that person are you expecting something out of their mouth? That, oh, you know, thank you for what you did for me back then. There's an expectation that's there. And we sometimes struggle when we don't get any feedback, when we don't get a response. Freely given is difficult. It brings joy and meaning and a lightness of heart. When you can give to something to somebody, and never give it another thought. You can see him the next time, and you don't expect to get anything back. But there's a freeing part of, of that in us. Selfless giving brings us some of our greatest joy. There's a lot of people that have come through this church that have served, have done, and have passed on. And the gifts that many of them did some filtered out after they were gone. We didn't know. Maybe some did. They didn't talk about it. It wasn't that they were looking for any kind of a reward. Their reward was in the giving. Giving before we are given to, participating in generosity. These urges to give are the only reason that humanity has survived. And they are the key to humanity in thriving. Tomorrow evening, the police banquet. Many of us will be there and serve. We have participated last year. We have given a basket again this year. But as I drop that basket off on Friday, Pastor Ben of the Presbyterian Church, he said, we've got a grand prize this year that is just unreal. On Thursday, five gentlemen showed up with a $600 smoker grill. They don't want any accolades. They didn't want to be known. They just put it out there as a gift for somebody. And they're trusting that God will give that to the very person that can use it or needs it the most. I think, you know, that is awesome. We don't hear those stories enough. 
But that's the key to helping other people. Opening a door for someone that is struggling to get in a doorway doesn't seem like a very big deal. But if you're the one that's struggling, it is huge. You know, and you've, you've heard me mention, people that are disabled, that have mobility issues, are not seen by a lot of society. When you are, for example, walking with crutches, and the person in front of you just lets the door drop, they didn't even think about it. It wasn't a conscious, well, I'm going to mess with this guy. No, it was just they, they don't even think. But when you're the person that's going through that doorway and someone says, oh, here, let me hold the door, it's a big deal. It is a huge thing. So we can give very simply. We can give extravagant if we have the ability to do so. Jesus calls us not to simply to love our neighbor as ourselves, but to love as he loves. As we go through and read those scriptures, specifically the Gospels, what does loving like Jesus look like? As you read the Gospels, have that in mind. Okay, I'm going to read this section. What in this section shows me or tells me about what Jesus is like, what his loving comes out of? And you will read through there, and amazingly enough, Someone slipped some stories in there that you didn't apply under that way. No, really, they, they've always been there. But we need to love as Jesus loved, without expectation, without a caveat or limitations, without any conditional approach. That's how Jesus loves. The third item is the indicator. Think about who was in that upper room that evening. It was Peter. He was kind of a hard-headed, hot-headed, quick to respond. Sometimes didn't engage the brain to think about what he was going to say, but he was all in on everything he did. He's in that room. Simon the Zealot, by very nature, he was a terrorist who fought Rome with violence. He was one of the a disciple, a terrorist. Matthew, a tax collector who made his money by selling out to Rome. He's in the room. Thomas, a self-protective skeptic. Can you, can you imagine these people all reclining around the table and, and all of the bios that you could tell about them or they could tell about you? John. A young follower of John the Baptist who was likely half revolutionary and half confused mystic. He was still going through the process. Several others who were all over the map in terms of loyalty, background, and character. You could put a picture, if it was available, of any one of those and then listen to the rest talk about that individual. They would have stories. They spent three years plus getting to know each other quite well, and they understood what it was to be loved by Jesus. In John 13 and 35, by this all people will know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Jesus started with an intensely divided group to show what Christian unity would eventually look like. Can you imagine the group that he picked? There were a few fishermen that maybe understood one another, but there were people from all over in this mix. Quite an eclectic group of individuals, but yet Jesus chose them to form what he was working with, what he was doing. If you love each other, they'll know you belong to me. I am very hopeful, I truly do believe, that there were people that filtered through yesterday that felt welcomed at a yard sale. 
there were some thirsty people that were really grateful for the bottle of cold water. Just simple thing that reached and touched them. Maybe they thought about it a lot, or maybe they didn't even give it a thought. But the cold water was welcome because it was hot. To recap this, the example, where can we take the posture of a servant in our daily lives? Where can we serve other people without expectation, without any recompense, just serving others? Where in our lives can we do that? That's between you and God. If you don't have a clue, ask him. You'll find out. Where can we take it as a church in our own community? You know, yesterday was an opportunity to welcome people. Some engaged, some did not. Some walked through and walked right back out. Others stopped and visited. Many picked up a flyer of a, an event coming up in the park. Games. Will they show up? I don't know. Will we be welcoming when they do? I pray that we will. I pray that we look forward to an opportunity to be the church of loving other people. The commandment, do we love first? That's, a, that's an in, interesting perspective. One observation from yesterday, there were quite a few that had limited mobility, but they were there. And hopefully they were engaged the same as everybody else. I trust they were. Do we, pre do we love others? I struggled when I put it together, and I struggle up here preemptively. Love others. Hopefully that my faux pas in being able to speak will let you remember that phrase. The indicator, if we have no love, we are nothing. We probably know some people that may fit that. They're very isolated, and they don't know what love feels like. And they are a very tough individual to crack that protective wall they may have. But if we continually show up and we continually Reflect love. Who's the winner? Everybody. You, because you are sharing the love of Jesus, and when the time is right, they receive it. I know we've sang this song, and I love it, but the phrase, they'll know we are Christian by our love. So when someone looks at a picture of you, a candid shot, and, it, and they you're, are asked to summarize who you are. What will you be doing? What will be involved? Will they know you are a Christian? Are you worried if they know? If you're just sharing the love of Jesus, that's all. The, that's your reward right there. As we think about today, Jesus knowingly knowing the betrayal that Judas had, went ahead and washed his feet. For us today, we have a communion table represented by the body and blood of Jesus Christ shared for us. He put himself on that table before we maybe even were alive. In reality, before all of us were alive. But he put his love of his own personal sacrifice for us. He gives us this opportunity to have the experience of communion, of sharing his absolute love for us. So as we go through the time, thank Jesus for his love, for his sacrifice of giving us his body. Father God, as we move through this portion uh, of the service, this communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, God, what a gift 
that Jesus has given us, that you are very supportive of, and the Spirit works in us in understanding the magnitude of what Jesus has given us. He knew who we are. He knows who we are. And he wants us to be in this relationship with him despite our, ourselves. He has given us everything. I do ask that you would bless the broken body represented by the bread, the spilled blood represented by the fruit of the vine. And God, that we can just take the time to go through and experience your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.